Well, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Wouter Den Haan. I'm a professor here at uh, the LSE. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to make some announcements. Uh, our guest, uh, Professor Tirol, will first introduce his book, Economics for the Common Good. And then after that, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions to our speaker. And then, I always ask this, is to turn off uh, your mobile phone or put it on silent. And even though I always do it, it doesn't always work. And so if you really want to embarrass yourself, then don't turn it off. <coughs> uh, the hashtag for those of you who want to tweet is LSE Economics, and that's on the screen too. Uh, the event is being recorded, and so should be available as a podcast on the LSE events uh, website. And then after the event is the possibility to buy Professor Tirol's book. You can do that outside, and if you want to get it signed, you can go back in on the podium and then get it signed. So it's an honor to introduce uh, our very distinguished uh, guest. Uh, professor Tirol is a professor at the Toulouse School of Economics. He won the Nobel Prize in 2014 for his uh, analysis of uh, market power and regulation. And you probably don't have to wonder about how many markets that applies to. That's uh, you know, a large set. And um, so by using new tools like game theory, he shed new lights on questions like regulation, right? what the government can do to, uh, to interfere in those mar markets and whether they should. Um, it's hard to underestimate sort of the influence Professor Tirol has had. So I'm a macroeconomist, so every macroeconomist these days worries about financial intermediation. And you know, one of the first places we would go to to get insights is uh, you know, the work of Professor Tirol. So join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Walter, for, for those kind words. And thank you for being here and for your interest in economics for the common good. Those of you who know me well may be wondering why I wrote this book in the first place. Uh, I've been doing policy work for a long time, basically conversing with public and private decision makers. But as so far, I never engage with a wider audience. And the tipping point, of course, was the Nobel Prize, because when I received the Nobel Prize, that's one of the things that happened to you, I got stopped in the streets all the time, you know, at least at the start, <laughs> at least at the start. And, and, and you know, people were asking me, um, do you have something I can read which is at least half readable? And, uh, you know, I, I realized at that point of time that I had to do something because people wanted to understand how economists can contribute to the common good and what the science is like and whether economists are actually a scientist in the first place and all those things. So I felt it was my duty to write something uh, both about the job of an economist and the first five chapters of the book are about what it means to be an economist and this is not something that you find in, in many places, you know, we, uh, we don't al always talk about us, about whether our economics is a moral science, about our conflicts of interest, about all those things. And the other chapters are about um, policy work, basically trying to think about the challenges of our, of our generations and how we can solve that where economics is not very useful and so on and so forth. So more generally, it was just reflecting on the role of economics in, in society. What came out of it, I hope, was a passionate manifesto for a world in which economics, used properly, um, will not be a dismal science, but rather a positive force for the common good. One that is going to help our institution contribute to the common good, uh, to the general interest. But what is the common good in the first place? Um, the common good you can think of as being a collective aspiration uh, for our society. What do we want our society to be, to be like? Um, collective aspiration, you might say. <laughs> what is this? I mean, we have different preferences. We have different informations. We have different positions in society. And therefore, it's very hard to think that we will agree on anything about what our society will be like or should be like. 
And what I propose, and it's not original at all, is to think behind the veil of ignorance. It has a long intellectual tradition, going back, of course, to the UK, to England, with Locke and Hobbes, and to continental Europe in the 18th century, with Rousseau and Kant, and of course to the US with philosopher John Rawls and economics John Arsani. Um, what is the veil of ignorance? Imagine that you are not born yet, and you don't know, you know, what your genes will be, so for example, whether you'll be sick or in good health. You don't know what your nationality will be, your ethnicity, your religion, whether you will be born in a rich or poor family, um, a very well-educated family or less well-educated family in a good neighborhood or poor neighborhood, what your sexual orientation will be, and so on and so forth. And you ask yourself, in what society would I like to live? You know, knowing that I don't know <laughs> Uh, where, what my position in society is going to be. Now, we can ask in the abstract, we would like to live in a very nice society, but we also have to take into account incentives, both the incentives of people, herself, and the incentives of governments in designing policy. So, I, I remind you of the importance of thinking about personal incentives. You know, whether we are students or professors or CEO or workers or politicians or priests or whatever, we react to our incentives and that's very important to understand. The people who designed the new myth, the myth of a new man, you know, this in the Soviet Union, they thought that, you know, we will create somebody different, someone completely selfless, someone who will not procrastinate, someone who will help the other and work very hard. Now, Logically, it's not, it's not a random event. All those regimes became totalitarian regimes. And that's because, of course, reality was different. And at some point, the governments had to force people to do things they didn't want to do. So if you don't take incentives into account, you are born to create uh, social and political disasters, not to mention cultural uh, and environmental ones. We also need to consider the government's incentive. And, let me just say as a digression, uh, in the last two centuries, our societies have been ar organized around two pillars. The first pillar is the invisible end of Adam Smith. Basically, you harness the pursuit of self-interest, and that's going to result in some kind of efficient allocation of resource, at least if markets are competitive. But of course, there are also market failures, and there are many market failures. There are externalities, like pollution. There are internalities, the fact that people always don't defend their own self-interest. I mean, they, they take decisions which are bad for themselves. There are informational primes. There are many other issues with, uh, you know, with markets, including inequality, of course. You can think of inequality as being a market failure. There is no reason a market is going to de deliver the kind of uh, equality that you like to get. You know, sharing of risk. You know, if you think about the health market, now with genetics, you know, you'll be able to know whether you, you'll have a cancer, whether you'll have this or that. And of course, you won't be able to get any insurance uh, in a market. The insurance market is going to basically disappear. Now, I think of uh, basically, and, and so basically, you know, Pigou, if you think about Pigou for externalities, was complementing Adam Smith, basically saying, you, have, you want to have self-interest because that's going to give efficient allocation, but you have to give the right signals to people and correct the incentives so as to internalize externalities and so on and so forth. But for that, you need a good government, and of course, there are lots of market failures, but there are also lots of government's failures. Um, just to give you some example, we burden our children with inaction with respect to climate change. We do almost nothing. Um, unfunded public debt and pensions, unemployment, degraded educational system, not at LSC, um, inequality, lack of preparation for the digital economy, and it's going to be a big, big change that I think our societies are not, to pre are not prepared for. But more generally, there are lots of government failures as well. And basically, uh, the book is trying to develop the ways 
in which we can improve government decision making um, in many ways. But you know, even with that, you are not going to get perfect go government decision making. And the question then is, can economists help achieve the common good? Is the market the solution or the prime? Many people think the latter. Uh, the market economy is dominant, but it has achieved only a partial victory because it has won neither arts nor mind. And I should say the economists too. And it's not the preferred profession of many people. And we, we need to think about why. Is that our fault? Is that you know, other people's fault? And we need to think so. So as far as the market is concerned, there is a widespread distrust of the market. Even so, almost every economy in the world is a market economy. Maybe North, North Korea is not one. But you know, by and large, you know, the economies are market economies. And you have this disconnect somehow between this widespread dominance of uh, this dominance of market economies and the feeling that inhabitants of all countries have toward the market. There is a feeling that the world is spread to private interest uh, with neither pity nor compassion. We lament the disintegration of the social contract and the loss of human dignity, the decline of politics and public service, and the environmental unsustainability. A telltale sign of this is a slogan, the world is not for sale, that you'll find in almost every country. So it's, it's really a gut reaction to, to the market. As for economists, despite our research, because you know, most of our research, of course, is dedicated to market failure. So you know, we worked on you know, correcting market failure, just to oversimplify. But it's fair to say that we are more pro-market than uh, other social scientists, and pardon my French tropism, the public opinion. We view, you know, there is a widespread view that economists fail to draw a clear distinction or clear line between what has a price and what has a dignity, just to cite Quant, Kant, or between the profane and the sacred, uh, to quote Durkheim. Other societies have we economists lost sight of the common good? So the book, Economics for the Common Good, tries to explain why economics discourse meets wide resistance. Part of the reason, of course, of the responsibility lies with us. We economists, of course, have some responsibility in this. Our judgment may, may be impaired by financial conflict of interest, by political friendships or ambitions for public recognition. We fail to communicate on what we are good at and also what we are not good at because you know, there are areas in which we economists are not very good at. We don't exert enough effort to share our knowledge. Um, I certainly say mea culpa on the third hand, maybe on the others as well, but for sure, as I said, you know, it's the first time I've actually addressed a wider audience as opposed to addressing experts in governments and corporations and the like. But part of the resistance to the economics message is linked to the difficulties in communicati communicating our knowledge. And I would like to focus on two such difficulties, cognitive biases and moral perceptions. So the first difficulty in sharing the knowledge is cognitive biases. And let me emphasize one thing. I'm not talking about stupidity. Actually, the evidence shows that our possibly misleading heuristics and narratives, our er errors in reasoning, actually are not that related to IQ or, in or education. You know, very educated, very intelligent people make the same mistakes. And that's, that's one of the things we have learned uh, from those cognitive biases. They are ubiquitous. But once those obstacles are removed, we all have the ability to understand economics, I, at least I hope, uh, at least what we know, because you know, it's a very inexact science, I will, I will discuss that later on, and of course, at any point of time, there's still a number of things we don't know, or which, uh, on which there is no consensus. Cognitive biases, one of those biases comes from the fact that we often want to believe 
we often believe what we want to believe. We see what we want to see. We interpret facts through the prism of our own desired belief. So for example, accidents and illnesses often afflict others, not ourselves, not relatives. Um, this leads to harmful behavior. So for example, the lack of uh, medical check, uh, check, or we don't put our safety belt. We don't put on our safety belt. At the same time, it also has a purpose because it improves the quality of life. You know, if we think all the time about a realness or death or that of our close friends and relatives, we won't live a happy life either. So, um, you know, in a sense, we, we believe what we want to believe. We want to believe that we won't be sick and we won't die young. But in the economic, in the economic realm, uh, we all dream of a world in which the law will not have to encourage or constrain people to behave virtuously. In which companies will stop polluting and avoiding taxes, in which people will drive carefully, even without police officers around. In this respect, economists are bearers of bad news. The economics classical representation of a society of purely self-interested individuals is a much distorted representation of reality, as I stress in the book. We don't, of course, just maximize our own self-interests. We also have intrinsic motivation to be generous, and also we care about our self and social image. However, the classical representation of, by economists actually capture a very important gradient, the need to take into account incentives to obtain an effective private and public policy. But when economists mention the need for incentives that trigger anxiety and resistance, we will all rather live in a world of honest, hardworking, and pathetic citizens. Relatedly, we want to believe in green growth. Let me just stop for a moment. The green growth is the idea that you can be green, save the planet, and at the same time, not incur any cost, maybe even grow faster. And you may ask yourself, if that's the case, why don't we do it? Who is, will be stupid enough to reduce the rate of growth, be poorer, all of that to pollute the planet <coughs> and destroy the planet? It makes no sense. However, green growth is a very important concept. It's a very powerful political narrative. I would say the same for the innocu innocuousness of uh, public debt. You know, the, the idea that if you go too far in terms of public debt, it may actually jeopardize your welfare state. And you, ca you care about the welfare state. And if you care about the welfare state, you should actually make sure that you won't be in a situation in which you'll have to discard the welfare state. And that's very important. People always think that the rate of growth will be huge, so there won't be any prime with public finances. Or they think that somebody else will pay. But in the end, you have to think about that. To sum up, motivated beliefs are the first difficulty that economists encounter when trying to get their message across. And by the way, populist party, left-wing like right-wing populist party, have a field day when pro promoting fairy tales, the vision of an economy free of difficult choices. Of course, every politician does that, but there are different degrees, and the populists are extremely good at promising crazy things. But it's not a random thing either. It responds to a demand by the electorate to believe that everything will be fine. The second difficulty is that we tend to act on first impression and intuitions. We see the easy to understand direct effect of an economic policy and no further. We see the direct and visible beneficiaries of a policy, not the indirect and less visible victims. A couple of examples, rent control. Rent control is very nice. It's, it's a generous policy because it's going to reduce the rent of people uh, who are currently renting a flat. Um, you know, at least you see the beneficiaries, they will benefit from the policy. What you don't see is the invisible victims. Those who tomorrow will come and will want to rent a flat, 
and won't find a flat because the supply has been reduced, or the quality of the flat will be abysmal. Same thing for labor market policies which are followed in Southern Europe traditionally. Um, you know, I've long been arguing that you should protect the worker, not the job. And, you know, there are various ways of doing that, but, you know, there are, you can incentivize the firm basically through a bonus malus system, for example. But protecting jobs is very dangerous. Actually, you know that in France, for example, 90% of the jobs which are being created nowadays are short-term jobs, which are going to lead to a spell of unemployment and maybe another short-term job later on. It's very expensive for society. It's very expensive for the workers. Um, it will be much more than 90% in, in a few years because with technological change at the speed at which it's going, uh, it's going to be very difficult for firms to create permanent jobs, given that the jobs, any job, will be possibly destroyed in, within a few years. But of course, you know, protecting jobs is very popular because what you see on TV when there is a dismissal is a face of people who are experiencing a drama, they are going through a drama, and it's a real one, by the way. It's a real one because in a country where there is a lot of job protection and you have very few creation of permanent jobs, that means that if you lose your job, you're not going to find the same job again. So on TV, you see those, those people who are going through a real drama, but you don't see all the invisible victims of the system who are all those people in this dual labor market who are going from short-term job to unemployment or have been discouraged and are no longer in the labor market. They are invisible. You just see this uh, particular instance of, of layoff. Economics is accessible, but sometimes uh, counterintuitive if you stop at first impression. And, you know, I gave you the example of, of the labor market, of housing, but I could give you lots of other examples that you'll find in the book. But, of course, public policies are mostly a reflection of the electorate's beliefs, and accordingly, it too often ignores the side effects. There is an interesting parallel here with medicine. Um, in medicine, the side effects are usually borne by the beneficiaries themselves, so the victims, except, you know, except with a couple of exceptions, um, they, they actually, uh, the victims are also the beneficiaries. Um, you know, epidemiology, of course, is an exception. But when economists point uh, to the indirect arm on invisible victims, for example, those who don't find a job because of the system or don't find decent housing, or the taxpayer, possibly, they're often accused of being insensitive or lacking empathy for the inten intended beneficiaries. So where do I stand? I went through the first obstacle to the acceptance of, of the economics narrative, motivated beliefs and heuristic or first impressions. The second obstacle is related to the first and concerns moral perceptions. Now in the book I plead for a wider vision of, than classical economics, economics as a moral and philosophical science, which incorporates knowledge in psychology and other social sciences. And that's actually very important. I'm very happy to see that uh, the Nobel Prize this year was for the third time in 15 years given, awarded to someone who works on behavioral economics. So that shows actually that our field is changing and I think it's very important. However, if you look at economists, I will say that other human and social sciences, civil society, religions, have a different view of the market. They recognize the virtues of the market, but they often accuse economists of not sufficiently considering the moral issues it raises and not acknowledging the need to establish a clear boundary uh, between the commercial and the non-commercial. Remember Kant, remember Durkheim. I have some sympathy for this view, but yet I would like to insist on the need to reflect scientifically on those issues. 
And that's not easy because those issues are very touchy, including for herself. I don't have an easy time to think through those issues because I'm blocked by various, various things. But I think it's very important to leave aside indignation and try to understand why we feel that way. Why? Because things we consider to be morally sound change over time, including in economic matters, by the way. And there used to be a time where life insurance or interest on, on savings, positive interest on savings, was considered completely more. The second reason is that morality has a highly personal dimension. When the flame of indignation burns brightly, people use moral arguments to impose their own value judgments and reduce the freedom of others. So for example, until very recently, in many societies, sex acts between persons of the same sex or different races were considered as being immoral by a vast majority of people. Now, how do we react to that? Well, you know, one reaction is basically to say, you know, this is my, your morality, but I have a different morality. You, know, you, you respond to claims of moral superiority by another moral claim, and that leads to confrontation, and you cannot decide who is right. But, you know, I will try to think scientifically through that. So, you know, think about sexual acts people disapprove of. And, you know, one of the first questions you have to ask is, where is the externality? Where is the victim? And you know, start singing in those terms, and then move on from there, and then make your own opinion. But just indignation, I think, is not the right thing. It may be a useful indicator of dysfunction in society, or maybe the inappropriate nature of some kinds of behavior. But we cannot stop there. Moral assertion, as I said, can override the freedom of others. And the other reason is that markets exist, whether we like them or not. You know, if you think about prostitution, organ markets, surrogate mother routes, and so on and so forth, you know, you just cannot close your eyes. Those markets exist anyway. So the issue is not to pretend they should not exist and so on. They exist, and the question is really, how you regulate them? Are you, if you don't like them, are you, you make them disappear and not saying they should not exist. And, you know, that's not the only thing you should be doing. Some of this indignation can be found in philosophers' writings. So I'm sure that many of you have read philosophers' books, and there are many, actually, many books, actually, which question uh, the market and, and the economy's reliance on the market. One of them, of course, was a worldwide uh, bestseller, Michael Sandel, Michael Sandel in What Money Can Buy. Let me quote from Michael Sandel. A wide range of books and of, of books. A wide, wage, a wide range of goods and services, including babies for adoption, surrogate motherhood, sexuality, drugs, military service, votes, and organs for transportation, are not to be commoditized through markets. No more than friendship, admission to elite universities, or Nobel Prizes are to be bought, or genes and other life forms to be patented. Now, some of those criticisms are based on ignorance of what economics has become in the last 30 to 40 years. Some are more relevant. And let me dig just a little bit deeper into it. Economics has, economics has changed, explored areas that speak to some of the criticisms. Starting, of course, with market imperfection, which have been much studied by economists externalities like pollution, price gouging, we interpret it as market power, asymmetric information, okay? Just think about admission to elite universities. Now, if you paid, you know, if it were given to the highest bidder, if you entered LSC just because your parents were richer than the others, of course, it will not be a, a signal of your talent, but a signal of the wealth of your parents. So then the value of the diploma will be completely lost. That has nothing to do with morality. It's just efficiency. You know, we don't want money to buy you a diploma, let alone Nobel Prizes. Sandel notes, by the way, 
Sandal himself recognizes this point. I mean, he notes that sur surrogate mothers may not know what is, it's like to carry a bear and then give up the child. Um, it's kind of asymmetric in the formation argument. Economists also have studied quite a lot the possibility that incentive backfire. They may reduce intrinsic motivation. That's what psychologists call the overjustification phenomenon. The fact that uh, um, if you are being paid for an action, it may cast a doubt on whether you are acting for the money or, for or by generosity. You know, if you are not being paid, you are doing something nice just because you are generous. Of course, you're also invested in yourself and social image, but you know, by and large, it's by, because you are generous. But of course, if you are being paid, then there is doubt about the reason why you, do, you are doing it. And in those domains where image concerns are very important, then it can create a crowding out effect, meaning that you increase the price and you reduce the supply. That also economists have, have studied. And finally, there is, of course, behavioral economics, which has been around now for a long time. Um, also, it, it caught up only in the last 20 years. So, for example, behavioral economists have emphasized the failure to pursue self-interest, contrary to the standard model of, uh, of the agent, the economic agent, because of self-control primes. And that's something, of course, that non-economists have been knowing for a long time, including governments. Because if you think about public intervention in the matter of cigarettes, drugs, savings, excessive interest rates, they are in part motivated by self-control concerns. Similarly, in the moral domain, or what's usually in the moral domain, one of the worries about organ sales is that poor people will enter into contracts that bring them immediate benefits in terms of their consumption in exchange of substantial long-term costs. So the idea is really that you should uh, pay attention to the fact that people, for example, don't sell organs just because they want cash. And then, of course, they, delay, they, they, they are not enough concern, even for their own sake, about their future well-being. Or think about voluntary servitude. Anyone in favor of servitude or slavery? Uh, I guess not. Now, if it's involuntary, of course, we understand why because you force someone to do some, something that he or she doesn't want to do. There's a big externality in other words. But what about voluntary servitude? So I'm selling to you my labor forever. It's a contract. If it's not signed under duress, then it should be fine, right? An economist should be saying it's fine. Now the concern we may have, you know, instead of saying, oh, we should not have that, period, we should try to think about why it's the case. Why it's the case? You know, conjecture is that actually the prime with voluntary servitude is that some people will want the money right now and actually will regret that contract later on. Um, they will be too impatient, too impulsive for their own sake. Or at least that's an explanation why we actually uh, prohibit voluntary servitude. Let me return to motivated beliefs. You know, I told you they were very important to our communication, the message of the economist. Um, it's very hard to communicate. And by the way, it's not only economists, there are also sciences for, for which it's a prime. Um, it's also very important to understand a reluctance to accept certain markets. So for example, we don't want to think we live in a in an unequal society, even so we do. And one of the signs of that is that if you open uh, markets for kidneys, for example, you can bet that the people who are going to sell their kidneys are very poor people, destitute people. Same thing for prostitution. You know, you see that they often those are very poor persons who actually prostitute themselves. And we have inequality just in front of us, and we don't want to see it. We just don't want to see it. Actually, sometimes the mayor is going to put prostitution in other neighborhoods so you don't see it. Um, but it's not going to eradicate inequality. 
But we, you know, we have multitude beliefs. We want to believe that we live in a nice society. Same thing with violence. We don't want to see society as it is, sometimes violent, mercantile, and so on. So in France, we stopped public executions in 1939 until 81, where the death penalty was abolished by Mitran. Uh, why did we stop public execution? Because, of course, there, there are embarrassing movies where people were, it was at 5 a.m. and people were rejoicing. They were bringing their children to see uh, the guy being executed. Um, and this is not the kind of society we want to live in. So we tried to conceal that by basically making it, destroying the movies, by the way, and also making it private executions. And same thing, you know, our attitude toward torture or corporal punishment is not only an agency prime, you know, the fear that actually you'll be giving a power to violent people to, to do what they want, but it's more than that, I think. It's also the idea that we don't want to think we are in a violent society, even sometimes, you know, when it might save 100 lives because, you know, there might be a terrorist bombing. Okay, so what the economists role in society? Well, there are bearers of bad news. Economic analysis exposes our deep values. And by the way, there is indirect supportive evidence for that. Uh, I don't know if there are legal scholars in the room, but you know, unlike economists, legal scholars motivate law and policy by overarching ethical goal, such as fairness and equity, when we economists mean efficiency, incentives. They avoid a confrontation with telltale signs that our morality is not necessarily what we strive to believe it is. So, you know, if we talk about incentive, we talk about efficiency. Even so, it's the same reasoning in a sense. We prefer to use fairness and equity. Now, just to, to beat a little bit on economists, um, because I, I've been defending them to some extent uh, so far, um, <coughs> It's true also that if we insist too much on incentives, we are, spending, we are spreading the message that actually people are not that nice. They need incentive to do, to do things, uh, to be nice, and to contribute to society. That's fine as, you, as long as you can control people through incentives, but of course, you cannot control everything through incentive. And there are many parts of our life which are not controlled by incentive, but are by our intrinsic motivation and social pressure. And you may argue that economists, by insisting too much on incentive, actually may destroy that part of our life because they're sending the wrong message. And you know, even if it's correct, they may be still be sending the wrong message uh, by uh, making people less eager to contribute on their own. Let me conclude with what it means being an economist, <laughs> what I believe it means to be an economist. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, I've been asked many times since the Nobel Prize, and actually not since the Nobel Prize, but since Economics for the Common Good. So since I wrote this book, because I first wrote it in French, um, is whether Economics for the Common Good was an oxymoron. Uh, well, uh, and, you know, it tells you something about the attitude of people toward economists, and we economists have to think through that, especially since the, nine, the 2008 financial crisis, of course, which was a very bad PR, <laughs> <laughs> PR thing for the profession. And many people um, also wonder whether it's a, it is a science. I, I don't know how many times I've been asked, is this a science? And, you know, for what it's worth, I always say, you know, yes, it's a science. It's a science because you are forced to make your assumptions completely explicit and totally clear. Then you use logical reasoning to, it, to get to your conclusions. I love this sentence by Dan, Daniel Roderick. Daniel Roderick says we use mathematics not because we are bright, but because we are not bright enough. And that's quite true, actually, you know, at least I am not, not able to, to see through the logical conclusion of some assumptions, of many assumptions actually. And you know, that helps you know, having logical reasoning. And once we have the theory, we of course test it with data that exists. We do econometrics. 
or we create the data in the lab or in the field. And then, of course, we try to use theory to understand better the, the data. And then we go back because, of course, often the empirical work reveals short, shortcomings with the theory. So in that sense, it's just like any science. But we have to be humble because it's an exact science. Good data may not be available. The theory is oversimplified, and I, I'm well placed to, to acknowledge that. And more specific, more specific to human and social sciences, you have different behavioral patterns. And also self-fulfilling phenomena, which is really something uh, specific to social sciences, the fact that you know, I may want to do something because you, always, you also do something. So like bank runs or currency runs or, or what, bubbles, asset bubbles and the like. And this, is, this makes uh, actually uh, predictions uh, much harder. By the way, I, in the book I insist on the fact that forecasting is not uh, the best thing that economists do and I try to explain why. I think we are much more comfortable in analyzing past events but also in proposing policies than at forecasting. And by the way, that's a characteristic which is shared by, by doctors, by seismologists. So if you go and ask your doctor, um, am I going to have a heart attack? Doctor will say, oh, hmm, you smoke, you do this, you do that, it's no good. But then if you ask your doctor, is it for tomorrow or six, six months or is that in 10 years or ever? The doctor won't have a clue. And you know, same thing, the seismologist will tell you there might be an earthquake. You, know, you have the factors that are going to lead to an earthquake possibly, but won't be able to tell you when the earthquake will happen or whether it will happen at all. Now populism, because of course that's the topic of the day, it forces us to reconsider the economy's duty. In retrospect, I must say, unfortunately, the book's timing was right. Today, in the US, in Europe, in the UK, sorry, I didn't put the UK with Europe, <laughs> and all over the world, populists are having a field day. Of course, populism comes in many guises, and it has specific causes in every country, but everywhere, the populists play on the electorate's frustration the financial and the eurozone crisis, unemployment, slowdown in economic growth, inequality, and also fears for the future, rising debts, robots, climate change, migration, and so on. They exploit the frustration and the fears to foster widespread hostility to immigrants, distrust of free trade, and xenophobia. And of course, people with expert knowledge are dismissed. There is no doubt, and it's quite understandable, that citizens want change. They feel that policymakers um, haven't done enough, that they don't have a plan. But change for change's sake is extremely dangerous, particularly when it's based on prejudice and selfishness. Steady, intelligent change is much less excited than fast, dramatic change, but it's only change that can give us hope. Which brings me to the value of making economic ideas comprehensible to a general audience. Repeatedly blaming politicians for flawed policy is unproductive and I would say even ir irresponsible. Fine, there are courageous politicians, there are politicians who are less courageous. There are talented politicians, some are less talented. Um, but like us all, they react to the incentive they face. In their case, the incentive is being elected or re-elected. Very rarely do they go against majoritarian public opinion. So we citizens get the policies we deserve. Economists must continue to explain using their science why, why populist uh, programs are disastrous. That's actually what we did in France with the National Fund program. We explained the severe consequences of protectionism, huge deficits, exit from Europe and the Eurozone, or Marine Le Pen's extensive use of the lump of labor fallacy, the idea that labor in is in fixed quantity. In my view, economists can be more valuable now than they have ever been, contrary to the current mood, 
in all over the world. But for that, we need to guide our countries through a period of low growth, anticipate the digital challenge, a revolution, the many socioeconomic challenges that it's going to bring. It's going to bring a lot of wealth, a lot of health, but also huge challenges for our societies. We have to design solutions to unemployment, climate change, financial regulation, inequality, and of course, explain the role of economics in the construction of the common good. Thank you very much for your attention. So now there'll be uh, time for Q&A. So try to be concise and clear, and then wait until you get the microphone from uh, one of the stewards, and we'll you know, collect a couple of questions. Um, um, thank you very much. It was really a pleasure listening to you. So I would like to ask, um, what is the optimal level of the regulation? So how to find this Pareto optimal level of not regulate, like not over-regulating and not under-regulating. And I would like you to answer this question on the example of the cryptocurrency. This is a very a hot topic now, because you can see the, the cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency, yeah. yeah. So what would you suggest uh, the government to do? And uh, again, like what is the level of optimal regulation that the government should probably target for? Thank you very much again. So a question right there. I'd like to pick up the forecasting point. A doctor can't tell you if you're going to have a heart attack, but he can tell you whether your chances are better or worse than average. And a seismologist can talk about the likely scale of an earthquake. If economists can't make that kind of probabilistic forecast, can this really claim to be a science at all? Um. Question right here, front on the. Yeah, no, 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 at the, at the front of the balcony there. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, uh, what is your opinion on uh, the French? Uh, I mean, the economic policy and labor policy of uh, President Macron, um, which is jointly implementing. It's great to have those concise questions, no? <laughs> <laughs> I have a few hours to, <laughs> to respond. <laughs> okay, the optimal level of regulation, uh, just right. You know, you, you, you want, uh, I mean, of course, there's always a trade-off between uh, curbing market power, um, and we see that now with the platforms, and basically letting innovation happen. So you want, you know, of course, want to reward innovation and investment, but you don't want you know, firms to abuse their, their dominant position and uh, basically get a lot of money just because they were lucky. And there are, we could discuss in more detail about what we could do about platform. It's not, an, it's not an easy question, but, you know, what we are trying to do, of course, is to try to design regulation which are not too information intensive. So by this, I mean that competition, po uh, po competition authorities often don't have the knowledge or they don't have the time actually to measure things precisely. You know, we economists, we write you know, basically models in which you know, if the elasticity of uh, this of that is less than that, then you should do this. But of course, you know, that suppose that assumes that you get all the information to apply this rule. And often we don't have it. So in that case, you, you need to do information light policies. And it's a more general theme with the hubris of government. Um, the government intervention has to be compatible with what the government knows. And that applies to many domains. So if you think about labor market, there will be a question, there has been a question on, on labor market regulation. But, you know, in France and in many countries, we have tried actually to second guess the firm on what shops were, you know, uh, useful for the firm and what shops were not useful for the firm. And, of course, uh, judges have no clue and they, you know, the, their decisions are, are almost random, uh, so it's very difficult. Same thing with climate change, with command and control. I'm not against all command and controls uh, instruments, but very often 
the government is trying to second guess. Same thing with industrial policy. I talk a lot about industrial policy in the book and say, you know, if you do industrial policy, you have to do this, this and that, but it always come back to, you have the information to do it. And in competition policy, which was your question, um, what we try to do, and that's not always easy, is to find rules which are kind of robust, so you can apply them even if you don't have the information. You know, what we did, for example, for patent pools or for regulating surcharges for credit cards or, or those things, you know, do, you know, standard setting or whatever, and there are lots of things that you, you want to do. It's not always easy because often you need numbers actually to have good regulation, but you don't always have the information or the time to collect this information, so that's a difficulty. Yeah, you ask about uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, okay, there are two things we should separate. There is blockchain technology, which is a great technology, and is already having an impact in, in contracts now. So for example, smart contracts, um, you can have the contract executed very fast, so you save on collateral, you cannot backdate the stock option of the matcher. You can, you know, that kind of thing. It's a cheap technology which is actually, um, actually very efficient and it's going to grow, that's for sure. Then there is a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. And then I'm much more suspicious about Bitcoin uh, for several reasons. One, it's a pure bubble. I mean, just like any fiat money, of course. So if everybody decides it has no value, it will have no value. Relatively, it's very volatile. And I'm not going to take a talk sharp, but you know, in terms of two-sided markets, if Bitcoin wants to get into the merchant customer relationship, they have to adopt a different uh, business model in terms of who is going to pay what. Um, and of course, there is a difficulty with Bitcoin, which is of course a way of avoiding, avoiding taxes and laundering money. So I'm not, to be honest, I'm a big fan of the technology. I'm not a big, big fan of Bitcoin. Uh, maybe that's my age, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I think it's dangerous and uh, I would not want my bank uh, to uh, invest a huge amount in Bitcoin, to be honest. Um, yeah, can we do better in terms of uh, economist forecasting? No, I mean, I was a bit harsh, of course, because we do some forecasting, and actually macroeconomists uh, in central bank and government and elsewhere are actually doing decent forecasting. But the point is that there are limits to that. You know, I've been working a lot on banking relation and trying to design rules. And by the way, I think Basel III is going in the right direction. You know, more capital requirements, more liquidity requirements, counter-cyclical requirements, better regulatory infrastructure, more use of exchanges and so on. All those, thing, all those are good things in my view. Now, you ask me whether we'll, have, we'll never have any financial crisis anymore. And the answer is, you know, I think we have reduced the risk of financial crisis, but to be honest, I don't know. I mean, assuming it's implemented, of course. There is another question, you know, when Donald Trump actually is going to dismantle the, regulatory, the regulation of banks, uh, we may end up with another crisis. But, or if the ECB uh, regulatory powers are actually uh, withdrawn by European governments, uh, I think we could also get into trouble. But even if we do things right, I cannot pledge, I cannot bet that there won't be any crisis because you know, we don't have enough data, the financial instruments change all the time, they are self-fulfilling phenomena, and so on and so forth. So, I cannot tell you there won't be a financial crisis anymore. There might well be one, even if we implement Basel III, for example, and we do it right. So, yes, we do forecasting, uh, but you know, compared to, to your doctor who cannot tell you whether you will have a heart attack tomorrow or in, in 40 years, I think we do as well, you know, in terms of... Uh, um, the important thing to me is, forecasting is important, of course, but it's also important uh, to design the, the rules of the game in the right way. In terms of policy making, it's actually very important. Emmanuel Macron's labor policy, and uh, I always say, and you'll read in the book, that I don't want to, uh, to get into politics for, for reasons that I could discuss later on, but um, I can talk about economics. And, you know, what, first let me just say a few words about the French labor market. Uh, which probably a number of you don't know about. Uh, it's a labor market, of course, with a very high cost, 
large unemployment, long-term unemployment. Very tense um, relationship between labor and, and the bosses. Very high cost for, for, the, for, for public finances. So in almost every dimension, the French labor market is a little bit of a disaster. Um, now, um, there are re current reforms. And you have to realize that the reforms so far uh, have dealt with the labor, labor code. Now, there are many dysfunctions in the French labor market. There's, of course, the labor code. I'm going to come back to that. But of, there's a trilogy, education, uh, vocational training, uh, apprenticeship. There is a choice of having a uniform minimum wage, which is the highest in Europe, uniform across ages and across regions, um, instead of having redistribution through the income tax. I mean, it's, it's a choice. There are, you know, there are, there are issues with uh, close profession. There are many other issues. Um, so in a sense, you know, you're not going to solve the unemployment prime and the poor quality of employment just with one reform. So what Emmanuel Macron has done so far just to oversimplify is basically to cap um, the amount of money, severance pay, that courts could give to work, dismiss workers. So the government has increased the severance pay by 25%, but I've said, you know, here is a cap on what the courts can grant to the worker. Now, I think it's the right approach because in terms of um, the issue is that the issue is not that the formal, the legal severance pay is too high in France. Raising it, raising it is fine. The issue is that when you are dismissed, usually you don't accept your severance pay. What you do is to go to court, and that process will last two, three, four, five years during which time you will be spending a lot of money in lawyers and, and yourself, and of course the firm concentrate on that. Um, it's very expensive and all of that for a completely random outcome, because how do, do you determine whether a layoff was justified or not? You don't have the information again. So let me come, so that's, that's the thing that and there are a bunch of other issues, other policies, like uh, simplifying the life of, uh, of, of corporations. Uh, it's very complicated. The labor code uh, has to be simplified. It's, it's over 3,000 page long. Even low professors that I, whom I know, who are actually specialists of the labor code, they don't know it, they don't understand it. You know, the best expert in France actually uh, don't master it. So imagine that if you run if you are running a 10 employee company, you know, your mastery of the labor code is, is limited, right? Um, now, will it suffice? Uh, certainly not. And one of the things that I've been pushing for 15 years in collaboration with Olivier Blanchard um, is actually a different way of doing things. So right now, it is a court who decides whether you are right or wrong in dismissing a worker. Okay. Now, given the court doesn't have the information, my own reasoning is that you should actually you know, delegate this decision to those who have the information. And those who have the information are the employers. They know whether this job is useful or not, whether they can keep the worker longer or not. Now, you're going to tell me the employers don't have the right incentives. They may dismiss the workers too easily and they don't take into account the externality of the dismissal uh, policy onto the worker. And actually that's what severance pay is about, is to try to compensate somewhat the worker for the damage which is done to the worker. Also it does it in a very poor way. It overcompensates or undercompensates depending on whether you'll find a new, new job fast or not. Now, if you make layoffs more flexible, so if you give the, flexi you know, the firms the flexibility to adjust to, to shocks, and there will be more and more of those, you also need an incentive. You need to have the right incentive. And the French system is, is a completely wrong system because the unemployment insurance 
is paid by social security contribution by those firms who don't lay off the workers. And the firms which lay off the workers, which dismiss, dismiss the workers, actually don't pay anything. They pay some severance pay, but they don't pay anything to unemployment insurance. It's completely upside down. You know, the, you have a principle in economics which should be the dismiss of pay principle. You have to internalize the cost you impose not only on the worker, but also on public finance and on the social security fund. If you don't do that, you, you have the wrong incentives. So what we need is a bonus malus or penalty reward system in which those who would, would dismiss the workers will pay and will pay as a function of the time the worker is remaining unemployed. And, and, and then the others will pay lower social security contribution. It will be a bonus malus system. And that will have lots of benefit, not only with respect to the dismissal uh, decision, but other decisions as well. So there is something very peculiar in France. For the French-speaking people, it's called rupture conventionnelle. So rupture conventionnelle is, you know, I'm an LSE employee, and I want to, you know, professor at LSE, but I, I want to take some time off, and I want to quit. Uh, so if I quit, I don't get unemployment insurance. Unemployment benefit, I'm sorry. You know, I don't get unemployment benefit because I just quit. But if LSE fires me, then I get unemployment benefits. So what am I going to do under the current law? Is I'm going to go and see my boss, and I'm going to say, fire me. And I promise I won't sue you. Um, let's sign papers, I won't sue you. And, you know, and, you know, the employer, of course, will say, fine. Otherwise, you know, I'll be very upset and you know, I'll, I'll create a very miserable life for my organization. And there is no cost because there is no contribution to the unemployment benefit fund by the firm that fires the workers. Now, there have been 360,000 of those last year. So you have to realize it's a wide scale problem you need to give incentives. I mean, there's no question you need to give incentives. And I think a good reforms will also uh, do that. And there are other reforms that I mentioned. Uh, for example, we spend 31 billion euros every year, you know, f for w training on the job and training of the unemployed. Now, you think it's quite a lot of money, but it's not certified. There is no evaluation. I mean, there are evaluation, but they are completely corrupt. And, you know, in the end, we are spending all that money without giving a chance to the workers to adapt to what's going to happen to them. It's completely irresponsible. So we have, to, and of course, the reason for why it's the case is that's a way of channeling money to the labor union and to the bosses union. But, you know, in the end, who is concerned? Those are the workers who want to find a new job, who are dismissed, and need skills, and they need reskilling. And that's part of the reform that I will have to go through. So actually, I cannot really answer fully your question. Uh, the jury is still out because there are other reforms which have to be made. Great, thanks. So we're ready for the, another round. There's a whole bunch of people at the, at the back. Um, so today you spoke about uh, the role of the, the economist in society and personally I see the economist as someone who um, uh, often only describes problems, he describes problems, but it, he doesn't do a great job or he doesn't seem to do a lot of explaining and finding solutions to the problems that they describe. Uh, and for example, you were talking uh, um, just before about uh, the labor laws, um, and during your presentation, well, you didn't explain what uh, uh, the uh, system of uh, incentives uh, you talked about just when the previous guy asked the question. So I'm wondering, why is it that we don't see economists so often on, on TV exp or, or talking to politicians? about uh, solutions. For example, it, it was the time uh, of uh, labor law reforms in France, and I've never seen you 
or I've never heard of your um, your incentive uh, idea uh, in, in the mainstream media. So how how is it the case? Uh, it's all young men that want to ask questions, but okay, just the, over there and then the one in the middle. Hi. Um, so one problem I um, think maybe plaguing the world economy right now is with the onset of globalization and a you know an integrated global economy. Um, I think like over the past few decades, you know we've seen global poverty go down by a lot. We've seen global inequality go down, but um, investment, perhaps you know quite rightly, is going to where it's needed most. Uh, and perhaps is skipping over the more developed countries. So in the internal politics of the most advanced countries, uh, economically speaking, you know, it seems like the economy's passing everyone by and it's like, you know, what's happening? We're stagnating. While internationally speaking, uh, we may be making the right decisions, but it's invisible and so politically, um, you may people, the citizens of the more advanced countries, may be motivated to rail against those policies. Um, and, and so I was thinking, if you think that's you mean, an you mean trade policies and like trade for yeah, free trade policies, for example. And so like perhaps perhaps that is contributing to this rise of populism yeah. and xenophobia. Um, so I was, I'm wondering if you think that's a correct assessment, and then perhaps what to do if that's the case. Okay. And someone in the same row was very keen. Yes, yeah, so just pass the microphone to the middle. How has your life and job changed since getting the Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> Shall I? Go, go ahead. Oh, my life has changed. Let me start. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, you are listening to, you go to amphitheaters and people. No, I, I, seriously, I mean, the. You feel more of a responsibility to communicate with a wider audience, as I said. Um, it's, you have to be careful. I, I call that Nobel syndrome, too, because you are being asked uh, all kinds of questions as if you were knowing everything. And of course, you know, I just have a small amount of knowledge, and there are many questions I cannot answer. And, and the, and, but the problem is where to stop. You know, there's a gray area where you know some element of the answer, or it's common sense. And you have to be very careful because very quickly you could give a bad name. There's a rule, I think. The rule is never say anything uh, to a wide audience that you will not say in a seminar room or at a conference or in a scientific journal. You, know, you have to basically have one life, not, not basically have a life where you say things you know, on, on radio, on TV, and, um, and the other um, to your scientific colleagues. Um, so that's, that's different, but oh, actually that, that connects to another question is, you know, you have never seen me on TV. <laughs> and uh, yes, I, I, more, more in France, of course, than abroad. I, of course, I, I've been playing a bigger role in France, but, uh, but the, the point is that uh, if you think about the profession and the incentive, again, we react to our incentives and to our own taste as well. So, you know, my mission is to be a researcher and a teacher. So those are my incentives. And, it's, and you know, writing a blog or being on TV or op-eds and the like, or writing you know, wider audience book is not part of my mission. Um, I can see it as a social value, and as I said, I feel more responsible you know, for, for doing it because it's important. As I said, you know, you cannot just do what I did in the past, just talk to experts in government or in corporations. You also have to talk to a wide audience, especially in those populist times. Now, they may not read economics for the common good, but you know, at least you have to disseminate economic ideas. Um, and that's part of our duty, I think. Uh, but don't forget, we have our own incentives as well. And you know, your prestige in a profession is based on your publications, and also there is intrinsic motivation. I mean, I'm still as excited about research than I was when I was a student, so, which I like my profession. I'm, I'm very lucky to have this profession, I must say. 
Uh, and you know, there are choices to be made. Um, and apologies, of course, if I don't always uh, fulfill my social duty. There is a global inequality question um, with free trade. Um, I think, I don't remember who asked that question, but uh, there is, uh, excuse me, uh, but there is this, um, of course, there is this effect that you have mentioned is that globally inequality has decreased, mainly because of China and India, of course, you know, with the cross. So free trade has, of course, and it's not only free trade, but free trade, of, of course, helps us be developed. At the same time, um, it has probably been good for our economies as well, except, except that there are winners and losers. So, for example, the US has benefited from trade with China, but of course, people who are living in the Rust Belt, for example, in the Midwest, uh, suffered when other people actually saw their standard of living increase fast. Um, there are winners and losers of globalization, of free trade, just like there are winners and losers of, um, of uh, technological progress. And the issue, of course, is not to go back to protectionism, because first, it's a very selfish policy with respect to the less developed countries. Um, it's self-defeating because at the end, you have retaliation by other countries. And instead of having the best of, that the world has to offer, you just get the best that your country has to offer, which usually would be monopolies. <laughs> and you know, in the end, um, we are just destroying value. But at the same time, we cannot ignore, especially with what happened in 2016, that actually there are losers. There are losers of globalization and technological progress. There's a lot of evidence of that in the US. Um, there is polarization of uh, in, income also. You know, you, you have a few people, highly educated people, whose income has grown by 80% in 30 years. And many people who have, whose income has stagnated and hollowing out in the middle. And you know, if you want, I told you we should not uh, predict things. We are not very good at, as the economists to predict. But if you want a prediction on this, um, it's, not, uh, it's going to get worse. <laughs> Unfortunately, so you know, the digital economy and the biotech economy and so on are going to raise the rents of, uh, of those who are, who are doing well. And it's going to create problems for, for some others. And that, that the question, it's, it's commonplace to say, well, we didn't take care of the losers. And that's true. We didn't pay enough attention to the losers. We were just thinking about the winners. Um, but that's, that's a real issue, and you know, there is no clear answer to that. Uh, there is no obvious answer, and we have to invest in education, primary education, but also on the job training and all those things. Uh, we need to protect the workers in those ways and make them reskilled all the time because the jobs are going to change very fast. Okay? And we need to, to build a system, and don't ask me anything about universal income because I have no clue how to calibrate that. We, every country has a universal income already to some extent, but um, of course, uh, the question is what level? And how do you structure the incentive to keep a job? And for that, you, know, you have to, to, do, to do on pay call analysis, you have to calibrate. And in countries where you cannot modify the other pieces of the environment, like social benefits or the rest of the income tax, it's very hard to, to calibrate those things. Um, but definitely it's going to be, to be a big issue and, uh, and, and we need to, to think about what should be done. Let me tell you another worry I have about. I don't want, I don't want you to live in a bad mood, but <laughs> you know. Another worry I have is, okay, we need to redistribute more through income taxation and education and else, of course. Um, at the same time, you need to redistribute something. So something must exist. Now, the oil rent in some countries like Saudi Arabia or Alaska, everybody gets a check or gets a fake job or something like that. Uh, the oil rent is not going to move. It's in the ground. 
But if you think about the top five market caps in the, in the world, they are all two-sided platforms. They were created by two, five people. If you think about the biotech industry, a few people create those firms. And those people are completely internationalized. They are mobile. And of course, the big danger, which we see already some of that, with the US so dominant in sciences, is that you know, all the big firms are created, the new firms, which those ones who are create, going to create wealth, those ones we can tax, hopefully, and, you know, and, and who are going to create jobs, are going to be in those countries with the lowest taxation, and which is more deserved, of course, the best conditions for work and the best universities. And that's going to be, I think, a factor of increase. And you know, when I think, as, as you said, is that there has been a decrease of inequality across countries. But you may have also another increase in inequality in those, in those periods in which you, know, you, you have more and more highly mobile groups of people who create their firms, and when they are successful, they, they go to the lowest bidder. And that's really, really a concern. Um, that's really a concern we, we may have. I don't think we have time for a whole full round of questions, but maybe one quick one over here in the middle, and then at, at the end. Um, what is your take on the EU customs union, and what do you think the prospects are for the EU moving unilaterally to eliminate the customs union with respect to the rest of the world? The EU moving to eliminate the customs union? Yeah, going to free trade. With whom? The rest of the world. With the, with the UK, you mean? Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, those things are incredibly complicated to, to negotiate, as you know. And by the way, I'm very worried about the UK itself. Not only because I think Brexit was a mistake, but you know, when it comes to negotiate agreements, it's not only going to be with the EU, it's going to be with under, you know, 130 countries or something like that. You have to renegotiate all agreements. And it will be almost be under duress because <laughs> you'll have to renegotiate them very fast. So good luck. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, as someone who doesn't like Brexit, you know, I, I will be almost tempted to adopt a, a tough attitude toward the UK. Also, of course, I realize that uh, it would be very rough on, uh, on our friends in the UK and also that we need the UK very badly in Europe. So whether we should be tough with, with the UK is actually a very complex issue. The prime, of course, is contingent, which is that you, you know, if, if you basically, the UK can have its cake and eat it too, then Europe is going to unravel. And I think it's a very, a very bad thing. Now, whether Europe will, will go further, will go beyond what it is now, and so I have a chapter in the book discussing that, and that has to, something to do with uh, how you up and feel, in a sense. You know, I would like to have a federation in Europe. I would like to have automatic stabilizers. I would like to have a common budget, a common borrowing, a common unemployment insurance, a common deposit insurance. But I don't think it's doable for right now for several reasons. And one of the reasons that nobody stresses, actually, is the fact that Europeans are calling for more sovereignty. But if you leave, if you want to live under the same roof, you have to play with the same rules of the game. So now we can have a common deposit insurance because we have a common regulation. The Spaniard cannot basically decide to encourage their bubble in real estate and let their banks go bankrupt, for example. It will be decided in Frankfurt. And you know, we have common rules of the game. But um, with respect to other things, we don't. And we see very clearly that beside the cyclical pattern, some countries manufacture a lot of unemployment, some 
other countries manufacture much less unemployment. And in those conditions, it's very hard actually to, to get any, any, any common agreement on sharing budget and sharing debt. Great, last question, the young girl at the end. Hello, thank you very much for this talk. So throughout your talk and in your book, you talked a lot about the climate, which is an obvious common good. And so I was wondering what you think could be done to prevent climate change as an economist. Okay. Climate change is uh, not only a market failure in terms of externalities, but it's a, it's a huge government failure uh, because of free riding, of course. Each government is trying to, at the cost uh, incurred by other governments, each country does that, and also because we are selfish respect to future generations who, of course, don't vote. Uh, so it has, it has a clear logic. Um, I was very critical of the COP21 agreement. I agree fully with the diagnostic, but it was basically the same as in 1992 in Rio. So, and you know, the fact that we just have voluntary commitments, including for the Green Fund, by the way, um, we collectively are going to help the poor countries. What does it mean? We have to pledge, each country has to pledge money as opposed to collectively promise something. Collective promises never work. So we have to, to do more. And by the way, you know, there are several uh, signals that actually the agreement was very weak. There is an agreement, you know, nobody came back home, no head of state came back home and said we are going to spend some cost fighting climate change. They all went back home and said we have won. You know, that's bad. It's very bad. And you know, I'm not blaming politicians fully because honestly, I don't know if I would have done much better. But let me put it like this. If you want an agreement that Saudi Arabia and Venezuela are going to sign, you know there will be nothing in this agreement. Period. You know, you, you need, you need, if you want to do something, you have to uh, take a different route. So that's the thing. I, no, we economists can argue whether you want you know, cap and trade or, or, or carbon tax. You can do, we can do that, and it's a complex problem, and we have different views, but it's really a second order, second order issue. And we need, basically, to explain, and we have done that, unfortunately, and it doesn't work, but we have to explain that we stand for a carbon price, and, you know, and then we see the details, much higher than what exists now. We, don't, we should not wait until the last minute and we should be generous, the, but being generous doesn't mean that the less developed countries should not be paying this carbon tax. Because you never stay under 1.52 degrees Celsius if the less India and China and, and Indonesia and Brazil and so on uh, don't have a carbon tax. It's not going to work. Also China now is, is putting some efforts, of course, impressive efforts, you know, partly because they are a big country, partly because they are much affected by the pollution. But, you know, if the less developed countries don't face a carbon tax or a carbon price, it's not going to work. So what we have to do is to accept, to transfer money to those countries, which is something that politicians don't like to do because it's very visible. You know, if you think about how pollutions have been successfully uh, controlled in the past, very often it's by do doing things and operating transfers that the electorate doesn't see. It's, it's very sad to say, but if you think about the 1990 Clean Air Act amendment in the US, which basically got rid of the SO2 and NOx prime in the US and did it very well. Of course, there was a huge redistributive aspect to it because the Midwestern state didn't want to have this agreement because they were those who had the coal mines. And what, what was done, um, what was done at the time was basically to give free permits, grandfathering, to those, uh, to those uh, power plants in the, in the Midwest. And we were in the US at the time. I don't remember a single article in the Boston Globe. Maybe, maybe I was not reading the Glo Boston Globe enough. But you're know, saying it's a scandal. We in Massachusetts are paying for, for, for the Midwest and so on. It was totally opaque. Now, this is not very nice what I'm saying, but. 
you know, the, the point is that public opinions are selfish. National interests always prevail. And we have to rebel against that, which actually some municipalities and states in the US are doing against Trump. And it has to be some kind of grass move, grassroots movement uh, to try to impose to do, and so that we do much better. Otherwise, we just have to cross our fingers that there will be some incredible innovations that are going to solve the problem. So before we conclude, I'd like to remind you that you can buy uh, Professor Tirol's book outside, and then if you want to get it signed, you can come back inside, and then we can uh, sign it on the stage. So finally, I would like to uh, thank all of you for joining us this evening, and please join me in thanking our speaker one more time. <laughs>